Chat with Traders episode 160 is supported by Birch. If you've got a credit card, then absolutely you should know about Birch for one very simple reason. The average person misses out on $300 worth of rewards every year because they're not using the right cards. Birch, a new mobile app, is here to help you get the right card and earn the rewards you deserve. Download Birch, B-I-R-C-H, in the App Store and sign up for free today. Markets, speculation and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Traders, investors, punters, what is going on? Welcome. For this episode of Chat with Traders podcast, I'm ironically not chatting with a trader. Instead, I'm speaking with Kimberly Troutman, and Kim is head of DRW Venture Capital. Of course, DRW began as a Chicago trading firm founded by Don Wilson 25 years ago. Since then, it has grown into one of the world's largest firms with offices in six major cities around the globe and over 800 employees. It has also become much more than solely a trading firm. If you think back to episode 139, I interviewed Bobby Cho from Cumberland Mining, which is actually the cryptocurrency arm of DRW. Now I'm speaking with Kim, who as I mentioned is head of DRW's venture capital arm, and perhaps on a future episode, I may get the opportunity to speak with someone from DRW's real estate and property development arm too. We'll see. So let me quickly run through just a few of the things which Kim and I spoke about. Why founders even seek venture capital in the first place and how investment capital is used, how investment opportunities are assessed, thoughts on risk reward, how valuations are determined for early stage companies, how DRWVC ultimately get a return on their investments, plus why the firm has a keen interest in fintech companies serious about blockchain technology and even ICOs. Now that you have a bit of an idea about what to expect, here is Kimberly Troutman for episode 160. That sounds good. Yeah, awesome. Um, so how did you land the position you're in today? Like, where were you at beforehand? So prior to DRW, I was working at Goldman Sachs in the Principal Strategic Investment Group, and I was part of that group for almost a decade. I went to college for business marketing, but I and I wasn't always interested in venture. So growing up, I was very artistic. I painted, I made jewelry that I sold to stores. I sold my artwork and I never thought as much about moving to the investment side of businesses. I was always dabbling in my own small business idea on the creative side. I was introduced to finance through an internship in college and started working at Citigroup um, in those years on a trading desk. And that's when I really started to explore my interest in finance. And then the opportunity came up to join the principal investing team at Goldman. And it was a really interesting combination of finance and creativity, because in looking at all of these businesses, there is a creative element to it. Um, From the structuring side, you need to be creative in this space, and you're meeting lots of different people and hearing about lots of different ideas. So it's, the, in my mind, the perfect job that that matches someone with a creative thinking skill set with the, you know, math-oriented skill set as well. Uh, so, principal investing team at Goldman, is that just another word for venture capital? Well, they're not, no, not as much because the group is making investments in 
companies that are a strategic fit to the firm. At DRW Venture Capital, what we're doing here is investing in companies that, on one hand, we know will generate a return from, but on the other, um, are companies that we can also be a customer of or provide liquidity for or help think through their strategic roadmap. Because we're investing at DRW VC in companies in the fintech space, which is the same space that DRW is in. Okay, well, well, let's let's get into that. So, DRW, as we know, is a trading firm, like at its core. You know, that's where its roots are at. How come it made sense for DRW to venture out, if you will, in and, and open up a, a venture capital arm to the business? DRW was founded in 92 by our CEO, Don Wilson, and the heritage, as you mentioned, is in trading. However, since then, the firm has expanded to include a real estate investing subsidiary called Convexity Properties, uh, Cumberland, which is our OTC liquidity desk for crypto, and Venture. Venture was a natural extension for the firm. The firm leads with technology and is known for that. So to move into venture, to have some skin in the game with companies that are also in our space made complete sense for us. And what year did DRW VC start? The first investment on the venture portfolio was made a handful of years ago, probably five years ago within my coverage, but we've really made the most meaningful efforts in the last kind of call it like three to five years. Okay. So, would you say it was uh, an attempt to diversify further? Was that a part of it? Absolutely. DRW VC has been active in the space for a handful of years, but we've made the most meaningful push in the last, call it, three-ish years. Um, one one way we did this was through Don's co-founding of Digital Asset Holdings. That was one of the ways that the firm started to explore crypto. We also helped to develop the patents associated with the Eris Futures Exchange, and we've made direct investments in companies that are already up and live with five million plus in revenues, which is now our focus. So BC today is focused on companies that have at least five million in revenues. Okay, interesting. And what I also find interesting is that uh, some other founders of uh, fairly significant trading firms, especially out of Chicago, there like um, I think the founders of Getco and possibly Jump as well, are now involved in venture capital also. Do you think it's possible that we might see more trading firms moving into the space over time? I think that's definitely possible. Over the course of the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of people enter the fintech investing space, and it's because there's so much disruption that's happening, and there's money being made alongside that, which of course makes it an attractive vertical to enter. Why do founders seek out venture capital? Like, what is the the key benefit to them to take a check from someone like yourself? First and foremost, entrepreneurs look to raise money because typically they need the capital to operate their business. But what we're seeing more of is entrepreneurs that are raising money, not just from capital sources, but from firms or people that can really move the needle for their company beyond dollars. And that's what DRWVC is seeking to do. So we're able to bring our dollars, but we're also able to bring our connections in the fintech space, our expertise around market structure and markets, and meaningful value add related to everything from structuring a deal to recruiting new investors to being a customer to advising on technology. So it's a more comprehensive picture of what an investor could bring to a business. And that's how we see our sweet spot. Right. Are you able to share an example of how you've you've helped uh, one of the, the companies which you've backed to move the needle? Like as an example, you, you backed such and such a company and helped them with X? I can't speak too specifically about how we've helped our companies in that way, but I can tell you that 
for one of our, the companies in our portfolio, Celerity, we're super excited about some of the projects that they're building out and the offerings that they have for financial professionals. We initially engaged with Celerity through their event data business, but why we followed on to our investment in that company and why we are working with them so closely today is because we're really excited about what they're doing with artificial intelligence to automate the financial professional's workflow and to add value directly to that front end trader, salesperson, decision maker. An example of what they're doing is for uh, salespeople at a large bank, for, for example, they're consuming content that's generated through chat messages and they're populating CRM systematically. So instead of a salesperson needing to step away from a conversation to populate CRM, Celerity is doing that automatically in the background. And then when a client interest matches an inventory a bond, for example, Celerity will surface that there's a potential trade to be done and who that salesperson should reach out to. So it's generally just helping salespeople do their job better for that use case. But there's lots of use cases that Celerity is working on to solve pain points in financial professionals' workflow. When you write a check for someone, how much control do you have over how your investment capital is being used and being spent? We always do the work on the front end to understand the goals of the business and help think through what the money will be used for if the entrepreneur doesn't have a specific direction for that themselves, which they typically would. So we don't reach back into the pockets of our entrepreneurs and, and tell them, oh, we, you should have redirected the capital this way or that. We work with them. It's, it's very collaborative to spend the money efficiently and to deliver results. Okay. So would you say you're, you're more involved than kind of just cutting a check and let them uh, and then sit back and let them do the work? We are. You're more hands-on, right? Yes. And and some companies require more of that than others, but we are very hands-on with our with our businesses. We We talk to some of our entrepreneurs multiple times a week, we're helping them think through everything from their next fund fundraising round to who we should introduce to the board, to recruiting new customers, um, to how they're marketing their product. I mean, really, we can be quite hands-on, but we are hands-on as it's helpful. Yeah. Do you find that some people perhaps want those connections and want that guidance even more so than they actually want the the capital backing? That's a good question. I would say potentially, I'll, I, I, of course that's really valuable, but so many early stage companies are burning money, so they need the capital too. How come they're burning money? Well, when you're building a new business and your revenues are, call it even $5 million, you're trying to scale, you're trying to grow, and growth costs money. So there's ex there's expense associated with that. And getting to that scalable point where the companies break even can take time. And how do you decide whether a new investment opportunity actually fits in with your portfolio, like the other holdings, the other businesses which you're already invested in? And, and just in general, like how do you actually assess new opportunities when they come to you? DRW VC is investing in companies that have 5 million plus in revenues and we're investing 1 to 5 million per check for a first check. So that's one initial screen. If the company has significantly less than $5 million of revenue, but it's in our space, we will meet with them and we'll learn about what they're doing for the future, but we likely will not fund. We meet with 10 to 20 companies, call it a week, for an introductory call. And what that looks like is about 30 minutes of us sitting with the entrepreneur, walking through their plan, walking through what they've done today and what their ask is. And then we go from there. And the next step could be a call with someone from our, from the business side 
to see whether or not we'd be interested in being a customer, or it's just a follow-up call with the company again to dig deeper into their financials and their business plan. But we spend a lot of time in those first calls fleshing out why we think the opportunity is interesting, um, what the growth story is, and then we go from there to look at the terms of the deal and the financing considerations to make a decision on funding. Sometimes we bring in other investors to join us. So we lead but we and we and we follow and co-invest, um, but we also can bring together a syndicate. So if there was a company in the fintech space that would really benefit from the increased engagement of some strategic customers of theirs or some hopeful customers of theirs, we can reach out to the investment teams that work at those firms, loop them in and, and get them involved in the syndicate as well. So we have not just a VC um, voice in the room, but we have a couple of other strategic customers. So we're really good at bringing others to, into the conversation if it makes sense for the company. If it doesn't make as much sense for the company, we're also very happy to lead rounds. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by lead rounds? Lead rounds without bringing in other co-investors. We could fund something directly, just us. Got it. And you said 10 to 20 companies per week is kind of the, the normal for, um, you know, how many people you, how many companies you would speak with on a given week. That seems like quite a few. Where do these people come from? Like, how do you, <laughs> where does that, uh, how do I say this? Like, are, are you approaching them or do they approach you? Like, how do, how do you guys, how do you connect with 10 to 20 companies per week? We get a lot of inbound referrals from co-investors that have met with companies that they think are interesting, but are either in some cases, not in their sweet spot, so they send them to us, or they're interested but would like to co-invest with someone, or they would like a second opinion, or um, they've been asked directly to refer a company to us. So we get lots of inbounds, and then we also have um, internal re referrals. So from the 800 people that work here at DRW, there's referrals made through this ecosystem, and then we have companies that reach out directly. And I'd say that the latter is probably um, the majority of the introductions and they typically come through someone that we know. So a company will reach out to someone that knows DRWVC and get an introduction. And I think that's the best way to typically engage with us. But you're right, it is a lot of meetings. It probably, I was thinking through the math, it translates to anywhere between sort of two to four um, calls a day. And we have a team that handles the calls and we handle them one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. So we're able to split that work up and get through it. But as I mentioned, that first call is typically 30 minutes where we learn about what the company's doing, what the ask is, what the business plan is, and go from there. Okay. So, you know, over the space of a month, that adds up to what, let's say somewhere between 40 to 80 different uh, companies, which you're speaking with. Obviously, you're not investing in all of these companies you know, there must only be a small portion of those that you speak with actually get a backing from you. Right. I think that's pretty common when you speak to other venture capitalists that the hit rate isn't anywhere close to 100%. So it's the same for us. I mean, we've, um, we're funding, call it five deals a year, um, five to 10. It's, it's variable. We are going to engage when we're excited and we're going to invest those dollars when it makes sense. So the frequency of check isn't so much defined up front. It's really more defined by the opportunity set. And we can be flexible here because our LP base is effectively the firm. The firm balance sheet is what is funding this strategy. We have no external LPs and that allows us to be much more flexible in how we think about investing. Uh, what's an LP? A limited partner. So okay. typically with a venture fund, there are individuals, institutions, groups that are invested in it as limited partners who have an interest in the returns that that fund generates. So most name brand VC firms are funded by investors and our group is funded by the firm. Okay, I'm with you. 
Um, one question I would like to ask you, Kim, how do you determine the valuation of an early stage business? I mean, I'm sure this is quite a complex subject and we could probably do a whole podcast around it, but uh, just in brief, these companies which you're investing in are, are just starting out. Um, you know, they have smallish revenues in the scheme of things. How do you determine the valuation of an early stage business? Is it in the idea or, you know, what they have currently or is it more so about the potential that this business has? It's all, most of it is the potential because the actual math of, of calculating of valuation or price is looking at forward cash flows and then discounting them back to today. So you're looking at what you expect that business to do in the future, and then you're discounting it back to today for a price. Now, if you have zero revenues, you're obviously going to have to make a lot of assumptions. And for our companies that have 5 million plus in revenues, they've already shown some traction. So if it took you 20 years to get to 5 million in revenue, or it took you six months to get there, it could help inform what your future projection looks like. And those are the kinds of things that we that we think about. But it's not an exact science valuation. It's how much money is the company raising? How much equity do they want to give up for that? Um, what does their future roadmap look like? So that, that piece does speak more to the valuation. But um, you're weighing lots of factors, not just price. So, for example, if there was a, a company that had um, some amount of, of revenue and the valuation was very, very cheap on some metric, but the management team was didn't have great experience or had come across trouble in the past or wasn't well regarded, then that wouldn't be something we would want to do. We, we like to look at operators that have a vision, that we are confident can execute, um, that have a great track record, and that have shown some traction in their product to date. Do you ever back a company with zero dollars in revenue? We don't. So we are focused today on companies that have at least five million in revenue. Sometimes we see companies that have a bit less than five and we will meet with those companies but the target's five. And if the company has a good visibility into their pipeline to get to five quickly, that could fall in, into scope. So it's not a hard line, but it is something that that we're targeting and we're focused on companies right, right around there, five million plus. Uh, another subject I'd be interested to hear more about and how you think about it is risk. Uh, obviously, as traders, one of the things we think about quite often is risk to reward, and I presume it's quite the same uh, in your field of venture capital. You know, how do you think about risk to reward? Because obviously, you're taking a risk when you're uh, writing a check and putting your capital into some of these businesses. How do you think about the risk to reward? DRW has 25 years of risk management experience, which is part of what makes us different. And it's how we approach all aspects of our business, including VC. Okay. And, and let's say, uh, just to play along with the same theme of, of trading, um, you know, we, we normally have an exit plan if things don't work out as anticipated. Okay. It, you know, we cut our losses. What happens if one of your investments doesn't go as anticipated? We're focusing on long on the long term with the goal of positive returns. We plan in advance so that if something is flagged as not tracking, we're able to address it sooner rather than later so that there's no surprises. Are you able to go into that a, a little more? Like, um, you know, you know, what happens if something unexpected comes up? Well, we're tracking the cash balance of our companies and what the companies are burning per month if they're not cash flow positive. So one trigger could be that the company is short on cash and might need funding. So for that type of case, we know how they're tracking and when, such that if the company has less than say 12 months of cash, we know that we need to start thinking about fundraising. So we're able to plan ahead by tracking our companies from a financial perspective. So there shouldn't be too many surprises there. 
if that makes sense. So when you talk about fundraising, you're talking about ra- raising like the next round of venture capital, right? Exactly. So if we make an investment and the company burns more money than we were expecting, well, you'll see that come through in the financials and you can start to plan around that. You can say, why is, why is this happening? Is this because the company's not generating revenues like we expected? Is this because the company's spending more money than we expected? And then you can drill in from there to to understand the dynamic. And if it is the case that the company needs to raise money, you should be able to see in advance that that's coming up as the case. We're not looking to fund a company for our money to last for six months. We're, we're looking to fund companies so they have at least 12 months of runway. Okay, before they need to raise more capital or they become sort of um, profitable, self sufficient. Yeah, profitable. Exactly. Okay. And just sticking with this theme of risk to reward, how do you actually seek to get a return on your investment? Like, are there various ways which you can do so, or is it only when you have an exit, when someone actually buys the business? Well, An exit is technically the only way you're going to get your money back. So either, I mean, you're exiting your discrete position, selling it to in a secondary. So the company doesn't sell, but you've sold your position or the whole company sells. Or, you know, you can sell through a private transaction. You could sell through a, a public IPO. Those are the only ways that you will exit your investment from a cash perspective. Your in- investment over time will be marked based on um, subsequent rounds. So we do mark to subsequent rounds and the valuations implied by those, but that's not a realized return given you haven't returned the dollars yet. Okay. Um, I might be way off here, but do you also get a return on revenue? You know, Let's say you buy a stake in a business and you have 10%. Do you then also get 10% of the revenue, you know, each year? No, (laughs) you don't. (laughs) Um, So when you make an investment in a private company, what you get is an equity ownership stake in that company. So what that means is um, the, the company could make the decision to distribute a dividend. And in that case, you would get some cash flow there. But outside of that, you own the enterprise and the enterprise will return to you directly on the private side when it, when it is ultimately sold. So you don't get to clip a coupon on revenue every year. Um, you, don't, you don't own that revenue stream. You own, all of, you own the whole, you own a portion of the entire enterprise. Okay, so what the business is worth. Exactly. Yeah. This episode of Chat with Traders is brought to you by Robin Hood. Put simply, and because really there's no other way to put this, Robin Hood is an investing app that makes it simple for you to buy and sell stocks and even options for free. Using Robin Hood's intuitive mobile app, you can now trade stocks and keep all your profits because Robin Hood do not charge commissions. The app also enables you to view charts, market data, manage orders, personalized news feeds, all with just a few taps on your smartphone. Plus, with Robinhood, there's no account minimum deposit needed to get started, so you can start investing at any level. This is perfect for newcomers who wish to start out investing small and learn by doing. And now, Robinhood is giving listeners of Chat with Traders a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at traders.robinhood.com. This episode is also brought to you by the Venetian Las Vegas, which is located in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip, featuring all suite accommodations. Soaring lobbies and atriums open to exclusive resort amenities, including Canyon Ranch Spa, over 160 retail shops within the Grand Canal shops, showcasing Barney's New York, Louis Vuitton, Tory Birch, and more. Celebrated chefs 
Wolfgang Puck, Thomas Keller, Emeril Legacy, Lorena Garcia, and Buddy Cake Boss Velastro create an eclectic mix of cuisine in their restaurants, from American, French, Italian, and Asian to Southern and Latin fusion. Plus, the Venetian offers the best in entertainment with Baz, Human Nature Jukebox, and Classic Rock Residencies. The resort features a five-acre pool and garden deck, and the Venetian is host to the most exciting worldwide gaming on the Strip. For more information, visit venetian.com. The Venetian Las Vegas, where you can come as you are. Uh, now, Kim, right at the beginning, you touched on blockchain and you, you almost mentioned that in some ways that was the beginning of uh, DRW Venture Capital uh, was when Don got involved with uh, uh, a company, I think it was Digital Asset. Beyond Cumberland, I'd just like to speak about this a bit more. Uh, so beyond Cumberland, what other ways is DRW actually connected to crypto assets and blockchain technology? So DRW started entering or thinking about entering the crypto space as early as 2010. We formally formed Cumberland in 2014. And that group is providing liquidity, OTC, over-the-counter in the major cryptos and tokens and is now one of the largest liquidity providers in the crypto space in the world. Separate from Cumberland, the firm is is inherently long Bitcoin. Um, Don also co-founded Digital Asset Holdings, which applies distributed ledger technology to large financial institutions and is, is based in New York. And we are in venture capital looking at companies in the crypto space that leverage the technology and solve for pain points there. We've made an investment in a handful of companies in the space. So if you look back, the some of the first investments we made were in companies like Bitfury, Coinfloor, and Simplex. And then most recently, we invested in BitGo, which is one of the leading enterprise custody solutions for crypto. And we're really excited about that investment. One of the questions that Cumberland gets asked the most is related to security. So it fits into that theme. And, and of course, custody is a major consideration for people that are trading in the space. So I guess maybe I should have asked this question beforehand, but either way, uh, why Bitcoin and why the, these cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, I think as Don prefers to call them, uh, why, what's the attraction? You know, I know there's a lot of hype around it. Obviously, everyone knows that. But, you know, you guys started getting involved in the space, you said, as early as 2010, which is, uh, you know, sort of the real early days. What's so attractive ab- about this this space to you guys? Well, from the venture capital perspective, the crypto space is still very early. So there's lots of disruption but it's very early and there's a lot that needs to happen to bring that market up to be truly institutional. So thinking about the experience of even buying and selling these assets today, if you're going onto your phone to do that, it's not always the best customer experience. So we're looking at platforms that are helping to shape the space to be a more institutional experience. Um, We're looking at market data companies in the space. We're looking at trading tools, KYC, custody, really the whole ecosystem of solutions that are associated with crypto are things that are on our radar to review from an investment perspective. Okay. And I noticed on your VC website that you actually have an area now on the homepage which says you're interested in hearing from people who are doing ICOs. How come? Let's speak about the the ICO aspect. Well, carrying on the theme that DRW Venture Capital is investing in businesses where DRW can be helpful outside of just our dollars, ICOs fits 
because of our Cumberland business. So Cumberland is one of the largest liquidity providers in the world for crypto. And we're able to help companies that are raising an ICO find liquidity on the front end. So if you had a participant who needed to buy ETH to participate in your ICO, that participant could buy that ETH from Cumberland. And then on the back end, if you're a company that's raised a lot of ETH from participants that you would like to sell, Cumberland could facilitate that. So we started reviewing ICOs from the venture perspective because of that obvious synergy between our two teams. And in partnership with Cumberland, we're reviewing them. Um, But I would say that many of them are not quality projects. There's a lot of really large rounds being raised at crazy valuations from projects that are not that interesting. We have a really high bar for for what we're what we're participating in on the ICO side. And from a retail perspective, I would certainly proceed with caution in participating there. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Uh, so at the moment, are you or Cumberland seriously involved in any ICOs currently? We are. So we have participated in a handful of them. But when you look back to, say, March of last year, if you were invested in all of the ICOs, there's very limited data. But from some data that we pulled, it showed that at that time, your return would have been close to 1,000%. But today, if you were invested in all of the ICOs, it's, it would be materially less. So closer to 50 to 100%, which, which is still which still sounds like a lot, but I think what's changed is the number of terrible projects has only increased. Um, The lockups in the space have increased materially. So a year ago, the lockups, there there weren't even necessarily lockups in these projects. And And why people were so excited about ICOs is because they perceived that there would be immediate liquidity, but that's just not true. It's taking a lot of time for ICOs to have a liquidity opportunity and you could be stuck in the ICO and not able to, to sell um, for as long as a year plus. And so some of the things that made the instrument exciting just aren't playing out as it was that as it initially was expected to. So why, why the lockup periods becoming longer, uh, you know, over the space of just 12 months? Well, that's just something that we've we've observed. Um, so I think a lot of things about the space are changing in, in very short in a very short amount of time. So I mean, you could look at the space weekly and conclude that a lot has changed. It's it's quickly evolving, um, which is why we're very cautious about the space as as we engage with it and we spend a lot of time thinking about how we engage. Obviously, when you know we hear about Bitcoin in the media. It's a lot of speculation and I, I hate this word, but it often comes up that Bitcoin is a bubble and other cryptocurrencies are a bubble. Let's just say that is the case, yeah? How would DRW VC be affected by this? Like the, the sorts of companies you're in, investing in, are they going to be, is that a risk? That would be a risk for for a company that had revenues that were associated with Bitcoin, if Bitcoin completely went away, I mean, of course, that could impact the business. But for most of the companies, they're not that do generate revenues from the activity associated with Bitcoin specifically. They they're also generating revenues from other cryptos more broadly. So it's not specific just to Bitcoin. So in, in that regard, it's not as much a risk. So it's diverse. It's more diversified than that. So someone's not building this. Well, I'm sure people are, but none of our companies are building solutions that are focused only on Bitcoin. Yeah. So a lot of the companies you're backing are more kind of supplying the technology rather than being dependent on the price of Bitcoin. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. Just changing gears as we go out here, Kim, let's say someone's listening to this, they have a little bit of cash, they're ambitious, entrepreneurial. Uh, How could an individual get involved in venture capital, even if it's on a very small scale? That is hard. I don't always, I mean, if it was my 
my parents asking me how to get involved in venture. <laughs> it's the, the, there are the the crowdsourcing platforms that you could look at, but if you wanted to get involved in a really meaningful way and really generate a return for yourself, I think it would be challenging unless if you could offer some real value to these companies as an angel. So, I mean, you could go through an angel network and find opportunities through that. And I've seen people do that and that's interesting or through your own network to back a company that one of your friends is, is leading or one of your relationships is pursuing. Um, But, but generally um, from a retail perspective, it's been it's been harder to get involved in venture, and, and is why most most people don't have exposure to it directly. Uh, just one last question, and I know it's a sort of one of those questions you probably get quite a bit bit of a generic question, but do you see any trends beginning in the space of fintech, and particularly the the areas where you are focused on? Is there anything which stands out? Um, anything that's that's noticeable? Yes, of course. I think one of the the biggest things that's noticeable is just how workflow is changing and is moving to more automated solutions. So, and I mentioned with Celerity, they're focused on automating workflow. One of our other companies, Dwa, is digitizing the law and they're taking regulation, internal compliance rules, um, rules in general, they're digitizing that and they're helping to make decisions be more technically based than human driven, or I should say humans can define the rules on the front end, but the technology plays it forward. So one example of how, how Dua's product works is on the trading side. So from a derivatives perspective, if you're trading a product, do you have to trade this product on an exchange? Do you have to clear it? Do you have to report it and where based on your jurisdiction, based on the time of day, the day itself? Dua's technology can give you answers to that real time right on your front end. So that to me is, is a great example of how the financial professionals workflow is changing for the better, becoming easier and more actionable. And, and if someone wants to find out a little bit more about the other companies which you're invested in, uh, besides the few you've mentioned, can they find these on your website? Yes. So the entire portfolio is listed at drwvc.com. So we have all of our companies posted there with a little description of each and a click through to their homepage. Cool. And if someone wants to follow along with you personally, where would be the best place to go? On Twitter, DRW's handle is DRW Trading. That's the best place to follow the firm. And what about you? You're on Twitter also? I am. My handle is Kim, T-R-A-U-T, Kim Trout. Excellent. Kim, I want to say it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Chat with Traders.